You're watching LMCC. Hi, I'm Kelly Murphy Rangate, Fire Marshal and Public Educator for the Excelsior Fire District, and welcome to First Responder TV, your local public safety source, featuring training exercises, safety tips, and much more. Here's what's coming up on First Responder TV. I'll talk with Ridgeview Medical Center's Dr. Kevin Saprell about COVID-19 symptoms, tips to help prevent the spread of the virus, and when you should seek medical attention. Minnetrista Police Chief Paul Falls gives an update on the Lake Minnetonka Emergency Management Group's COVID-19 response. When thunder roars, head indoors. You can increase your chances of survival if you know what to do when severe weather strikes. Scam Alert will give you an update on COVID-19 scams that have been targeting citizens in the lake area. Kevin, thanks for joining us today to talk about COVID-19. I know you're really busy because you're an ER doctor and a medical director. Well, thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Is it COVID-19 or do I have a cold or do I have allergies? What should people do when they have overlapping symptoms? That's a great question and it's tough to tell. The reality is it's very difficult to distinguish COVID from the common cold and the common cold is still spreading in the community. Influenza is still spreading, although it's come down in the last several weeks, thankfully. Generally, COVID is associated with abrupt onset of fevers, chills, body aches, cough, shortness of breath, sometimes some runny nose and sore throat. So the patients who are really sick with COVID, they know it. They are really sick and they feel terrible. One of the interesting distinguishing symptoms that I've been seeing is patients describe this lung pain, as they call it, and that it hurts to breathe. And that's a little unique, but the answer to the question is very hard to tell. A test can certainly help, but unfortunately, testing resources are still somewhat limited. We don't advise routine testing for people with mild symptoms because it doesn't change what we do. And that is basically stay home, keep our fever down, and stay hydrated. I think it's really Good that you mentioned staying hydrated because I think that's one of the things that you don't hear very often. It is important. It's important to just maintain kind of good circulatory support to your whole body. We lose more fluids when we have a fever. So you have to you definitely have to drink a few more. You don't want to overdo it. You don't want to be drinking gallons a day. There is some actual preliminary research that maybe being overhydrated with COVID in particular might be worse for the lungs. Moderation is good and just stay well hydrated, eat a healthy diet, that kind of thing. So who is at most risk for COVID-19? I know the information changes daily and some people really get confused about the ages and the, the spans of age. Can you help uh, clarify some of that? Well, let's break that down into two answers actually. Number one, who's most at risk for getting the virus that causes COVID? And that is people who are out and about, not washing their hands frequently, not maintaining social distancing, following the current guidelines that we all should be doing. Those are the people most at risk for contracting the virus. Now, the second part of the answer is who's most at risk for getting really sick from COVID? Yes people in nursing homes, age greater than 65, chronic lung disease, heart disease, diabetes, immunocompromised, maybe even hypertension. Those are the people that are most at risk for getting really sick. Then there's a subcategory of people that we don't quite understand, young, healthy people that get sick. And we're not sure about that, why that is. It's probably something genetic and there's a lot of research going into trying to figure that out. So can you explain to our viewers the difference between someone who carries the virus and somebody actually gets the symptoms or the virus? And that has to be broken down into two potential categories as well. There are people that test positive, that never get sick, and those we would call asymptomatic carriers. There's a lot of uncertainty as to how many of those people there are. Um, and primarily because we don't test enough to know. We don't test a lot of asymptomatic people, and that's because we're conserving our testing resources. As more tests become available, we'll have more answers to that. 
But the second category of people are, they have no symptoms, they have a positive test, but then get sick. And those we call pre-symptomatic. The other uncertainty is how infectious are they? Generally, people that don't have symptoms are probably not shedding virus, but we don't know. And we're acting now more like that's a little more concerning than we thought before, and that's why some of the recommendations have changed. So if people have the virus, they have the symptoms, but they live with family members or a roommate or you know someone else, a husband, wife, a partner, how do they protect the people that live with them from getting the virus? What steps can they take? Yeah, and that's what we refer to in epidemiology as isolation. So there's a, a difference between quarantine. Quarantine is keeping someone under watch to see if they develop symptoms. And that's what the family members of that person should be doing, staying home for 14 days to see if they develop symptoms. A patient who is sick with COVID or presumed to be COVID needs to self-isolate. They really just need to isolate themselves at home, have as little family to family interaction and contact as they can. They should be diligently cleaning their hands, covering their cough with their arm. And again, just, just stay home, please stay home. Uh, that's the most important thing. Explain the difference in the masks we are seeing on the news and social media and that people are wearing. If a person chooses to cover their face with a scarf, hanky, or other material, what are the guidelines of placing your own mask on your own face? Yeah, CDC has done a really great job with their homemade mask webpage, and I would encourage anyone that's considering or wants to wear a mask to really go to that because they have done a nice job telling you how to wear them, what to, how to make them. Sure, could a scarf provide some barrier? It can, it's not ideal. Ideally, you want a tight fitting, tightly woven cotton mask that's tightly fitted to your face. But they, they serve two purposes. One primarily is to stop stuff from going out from a potentially infectious person. We call that source control. But they also may block things from coming in. So when you're at the grocery store and you're looking for the perfect bunch of bananas and that person walks up to you right into what we all now have is this big, huge personal space and it gets violated all the time. That is why they're starting to recommend that because they realize the six foot radius just isn't always practical. Not everyone adheres to it. And so that can potentially provide more barrier when the six foot stuff breaks down. I will add one thing though, that I think is underemphasized in terms of when people wear masks. You and I wear masks all the time. We're used to it and we know not to touch them. What they are, they are also virus collecting devices. And so when people wear masks and they constantly touch it or pull it down, now the stuff is on their hands and then they touch other things. And that's why historically we had to have advised the general public to not wear masks. It turns out now, and I don't know the research behind it, but some of the experts have determined that that risk is outweighed by the benefits of the first stuff I described. And so now they're making the recommendation, but we just have to be careful to not touch them frequently and or just wash our hands or hand sanitize very frequently if we are wearing masks. So what does the coronavirus do to the body? That's a great question that's currently undergoing a ton of research. We know that it attaches to cells in our respiratory and GI tract that are called ACE2 receptors. Those receptors, it turns out, are also very important for the balance of fluid in our body and regulating our blood pressure. What can happen is in certain people, they may be a little more predisposed to having an imbalance of that fluid status. You get a lot of inflammation and some fluid buildup in the lungs, which is essentially pneumonia, it's viral pneumonia. There is also some recent studies that are coming out now to suggest that maybe it also affects hemoglobin, which is the chemical in our red blood cells that carries and delivers oxygen. Perhaps this is actually upsetting its normal function, so it's not operating properly and delivering oxygen to our body, even though 
our lungs are actually working better than we thought and, and getting enough oxygen, it's not being delivered enough. So the reality to that question is there's a lot of research and now that it's in the United States, we expect to see more and more really good studies. I know of three that are ongoing at the university right now looking at different medications that might help try to block those inflammatory side effects. So if somebody has the coronavirus and their symptoms are getting worse, at what point should they go to the doctor or at what point should they be calling 911? For sure, if they get into a situation where they literally find themselves saying, I can't breathe, and, and that's really all they can say at one time, that's a call to 911. Or any other ongoing underlying medical problems are decompensating or getting out of control, then we need to see you in the emergency room. So in general, once it's been determined that I have COVID-19, how long would I or someone with COVID-19 have to be in isolation? The length of time someone needs to self-isolate is dependent on one thing, and that is number one, if you are tested or not tested. If you're not tested and we presume you have COVID, after seven days of symptoms, if you haven't had a fever for three days or, and your symptoms are better, then you can take yourself out of self-isolation. If you've been tested or we're using testing to determine whether you need to stay in isolation, it needs to be a week from the onset or from the, the diagnosis or your positive test, then you need two subsequent negative tests 24 hours apart. Most of us, most of the healthcare providers are using the non-testing method where after a week, if you have no fevers or improved symptoms for three days, then you're done. Because there's been a lot of media coverage about the lack of respirators out there, I'm trying to help the common person, our viewers understand what a respirator is and when a patient with COVID-19 might need to be put on a respirator. We use respirators slash ventilators. We use them for the most severe respiratory symptoms that we can't control with other means. So they would need to be in pretty severe respiratory distress with very low oxygen levels before we would put the tube down into their lungs and put them on a breathing machine. When you bring up ventilators and shortages, I will tell you we're doing pretty good in the system here. We get you know, very routine reports and we have lots of ventilators available right now, which is good and that's part of why we want to delay this surge as much as we can. I do think there is a little confusion in the media about a respirator versus a ventilator. Yeah, we generally refer to the device that we put a patient on to breathe for them as a ventilator. We generally refer to a respirator as an N95 or N100 mask or plastic device with the filters on both sides. We refer to those as respirators. So is there any information you can share about COVID-19 that would help ease people's minds, including first responders and their families? We're all very apprehensive about this in many, many ways. I actually just participated in a national uh, webinar with other EMS physicians throughout the country. It was hosted by a couple of physicians from Seattle. I ended that webinar with actually a really good feeling about where we are in this part of the country. We're not New York. We have a different healthcare system. We have a different EMS system. We don't have that kind of population density. It turns out Seattle is actually in a relatively similar situation with regards to the volume and the severity of patients that they're seeing. Their EMS system is not overwhelmed. They're doing just fine. They're not limiting resources at this time. They also gave a tremendous amount of reassurance that their providers are not getting sick. They expressed more concern about their employees and, and the EMS providers getting sick at the fire stations and ambulance quarters because they're not maintaining social distancing there than they worry about them out on the job. They're also doing what we're doing here. They call it a scout, we call it a doorway assessment here. In our system, that's generally a first responder. They say, hey, what's going on? And, you know, and if they can't determine that there's some sort of a life-threatening emergency that they need to go busting in, they don't go in, they don't make patient contact. And that's preserving PPE and it's minimizing risk for our first responders. I'm very reassured by the delay of the surge. It's done exactly what we want and kudos to the state for, for really 
trying to adhere the best we can to the stay at home. I do anticipate it will probably go on a little longer than we first thought, but we really think it's working and that's opening up those hospital beds, opening up those ICU beds. It's letting us prepare for you know, alternative facilities if we need to, and it's, it's getting more PPE that we need and, and making sure we have the ventilators. It's really working. And I'm feeling pretty good about where Minnesota and in particular where the metro area is right now. We'll get through this the best we can with the continued good cooperation of all the healthcare providers, emergency services, and the general public and doing what it is they need to do. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today. Well, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. First Responder TV will be back after this short break. Hi, Minnesota. Governor Tim Walz here. We're in an unprecedented battle against the COVID-19 virus. The state of Minnesota is doing everything possible to keep you safe, but we need your help. We need you to stay home, flatten the curve on COVID. Let's get through this thing together. Minnetrista Police Chief Paul Falls, chair of the Lake Minnetonka Emergency Management Group, gives us an update on the agency's response plans for the COVID-19 pandemic. The Lake Minnetonka Emergency Management Group is a multi-jurisdictional agency comprised of 18 cities around Lake Minnetonka area. The objective of our emergency management group is to provide coordinated response efforts during an emergency or a disaster. The idea came years ago that if we all work together, we could coordinate a joint plan and then also share our resources and staffing. We've done a number of things in response to COVID-19. We've certainly reviewed a lot of our response plans as far as responding to medicals and, and other calls and trying to develop practices that limit exposure if there should be some, rather than sending multiple officers into a call that really doesn't justify that much help. Sending one in individually if, if there's an immediate life safety issue. As a group, we're looking at it regionally as well. And so we have also created an emergency staffing plan that would allow us to utilize staff from all of our agencies to cover our entire area should we be so short staffed that we need to assist each other. In response to COVID-19, we have stepped up some of the personal protective equipment that we will be wearing. First responders, police, fire, and EMS alike. If, if we do get called to the scene of a potential COVID-19 illness. We normally would wear rubber gloves, but in addition to that, you're gonna see officers and, and other staff wearing eye protection, face masks, and in some case, maybe even full gowns. If you don't need to have contact with the police or fire or EMS, don't. If you do, by all means, call us. If it's an emergency, dial 911, absolutely. But if you're just gonna make a police report, please don't come into the lobby, just call us on the phone. Anything that we can handle by phone, we would really appreciate doing that way just to limit that exposure. It's really important for the public to, first of all, just understand all of the warnings and, and orders that are coming out from the federal, state, county, and local government levels. All of that information is really designed to keep them safe and to protect others as well. It's readily available everywhere. We have it on our city website, our Facebook page, as do all of the cities involved in our group. So it's important to, to pay attention to that information because it does change relatively quickly. So make sure you stay up to date on that information and then just follow those rules. I think it's important for people to know that the vast majority of people that do get this are going to recover and be just fine. And we are going to get through this. I think uh, there's a lot of plans in place. There's a lot of very, very smart people working on this problem. And so information is, is key. Just understanding that, knowing that and practicing that and we'll all get through this together. Acting quickly and knowing what to do when severe weather strikes is key to staying safe. Here are some tips to help you and your family be prepared for hazardous weather conditions. Severe weather can happen anytime, creating hazardous conditions that include thunderstorms, damaging winds, tornadoes, large hail, and flooding. You can increase your chances of survival if you know what to do when severe weather strikes. Develop a disaster plan with an emergency meeting place for you and your family. Make plans for when you're inside the home and when outdoors.
Identify a safe place to take shelter. Pick a room in your home such as the basement or an interior room on the lowest floor with no windows. Practice your plan. Conduct a family severe weather drill regularly so everyone knows what to do if severe weather is approaching. If you have time, secure loose objects, close windows and doors, and move any valuable objects inside or under a sturdy structure. Check the forecast regularly on local news or radio to see if you're at risk for severe weather. A watch means you need to be prepared for the storm. Severe thunderstorms are possible in and near the watch area. Stay informed and be ready to act if a severe thunderstorm warning is issued. Warnings mean severe weather has been reported by spotters or indicated by radar. There is imminent danger to life and property and you need to take action. Acting quickly when severe weather strikes is key to staying safe. If you're at your house, go to your secure location if a severe thunderstorm warning has been issued. Take your pets with you if time allows. If you're outside, go inside a sturdy building immediately. Sheds and storage facilities are not safe during a severe thunderstorm. If you're in a vehicle, that's safer than being outside. However, drive to the closest secure shelter if there is sufficient time. Stay weather ready and continue to listen to local news or the radio to stay updated about additional watches and warnings. If the severe thunderstorm produces a tornado, seek shelter in a sturdy building. Go to the lowest level of the building, preferably in a basement, and get under a heavy desk or workbench, or sit next to the wall and cover your head with your arms and hands. If a lower level is not available, move to an interior room hallway. Put as many walls between you and the outside of the building as possible and stay away from windows. As a last resort, you could climb into a bathtub or under a bed or sofa. If you're caught outside, lie flat on the ground and cover your head with your hands. Be aware of flying debris. You should postpone outdoor activities if thunderstorms are imminent. Lightning can travel 5 to 10 miles away from the thunderstorm and strike the ground. If you can hear thunder, lightning can strike. Stay away from anything metal, pools and lakes, and never stand under a tree. Seek shelter in a sturdy building as soon as possible. For more information, visit the National Weather Service's website at weather.gov. And remember, when thunder roars, go indoors. Save humanity by really, really not getting anywhere near it. It's time for Scam Alert. This special edition features COVID-19 scams and other scams that have been reported to local police departments. Emails and websites are promising vital information about keeping safe from the coronavirus pandemic. However, many of them are scams that push malware or ransomware and attempt to steal passwords and personal information. One of the most recent coronavirus hoaxes is an Android app called COVID Lock. It claims to provide access to a map that includes real-time virus tracking and statistics. In reality, the app is laced with ransomware. COVID Lock uses techniques to deny the victim access to their phone by forcing a change in the password used to unlock the phone. This is known as a screen lock attack. COVID Lock then charges $100 in bitcoins to unlock infected devices. Another scam involves emails sent to college students that look like official communications from their university that offers bogus updates about closures and other coronavirus related news. A variation of this scam supposedly comes from employers and targets people who are working from home. In reality, both scams provide links to fake OneDrive or Office 365 login screens that capture user credentials. Another phishing scam appears to come from the World Health Organization and promises information on safety measures to avoid infection. However, the link takes you to a realistic looking site that prompts them to share personal information. Another scam website claimed to offer face masks but instead included malware attachments. You should be highly skeptical of emails and websites that look to provide information or goods related to the ongoing pandemic. One of the most reliable sources for coronavirus-related information is the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. However, you need to confirm that the emails or websites are from a legitimate agency. The World Health Organization has said people are posing as its representatives and trying to get sensitive information or direct donations through emails, phone calls, and text messages. These scams are feeding off the heightened fear of the novel coronavirus. 
Police are warning people about these email scams that take advantage of people worried about COVID-19 and tries to steal their money or sensitive information. One scam involves a person getting an email saying their recipient has been contaminated by the novel coronavirus. The email then asks for credit card information to order a shipment of medication. Other scams include private companies offering fast COVID-19 tests for a price, a place to buy cheap, effective masks, or fraudsters urging people to invest in hot new stocks related to the illness. You need to get your information from reliable sources. Public health workers will never ask for financial information in an email or over the phone. Be wary of anyone offering miracle cures or faster tests. Research any charities that request money to see if they are fraudulent. You should approach unsolicited medical advisory emails with caution, especially if they have links or attachments. The Carver County Sheriff's Office and Minnesota Department of Revenue is warning citizens about a scam occurring in the metro area. A scammer is knocking on doors and posing as an agent from the Department of Revenue. They demand that the victim make immediate payment of back taxes owed, or they threaten to call law enforcement to collect the money. The Minnesota Department of Revenue never contacts customers demanding immediate payment without first mailing a letter, and the department will not threaten to send the police to a customer's home. The Department of Revenue does not require that you provide payment information over the phone. If you are concerned about a potentially fraudulent visit, call, or email from someone who claims to be from the Minnesota Department of Revenue, do not call any telephone numbers that the scammer has provided you. Instead, call the Minnesota Department of Revenue directly at 651-556-3000 or 800-657-3666 and an authorized staff member will be able to determine if the contact you received was legitimate. A Chaska resident received a phone call saying that their Amazon Prime account had been compromised after ordering a refurbished iPhone. They said the Visa card attached to the Amazon account had been frozen because the order seemed to be fraudulent. They needed to give their Amazon username and password for verification or else they would block the account. It was confirmed this was a scam through Amazon's customer service. Some departments at Amazon make outbound calls to customers, but they'll never ask that you disclose or verify your Amazon password, credit card, or banking account number. This information should only be submitted when completing an order or making updates in the Your Account section of the website. If you receive a suspicious call or encounter any other uses of the Amazon name that you think may be fraudulent, report it directly on Amazon.com. If you did respond to a suspicious call, email, or forged website and entered your username and password or any other personal information, unauthorized individuals may have collected that information. You should update your Amazon password immediately. A local resident received a call from a Hennepin County Sheriff's Office deputy who told her that she had failed to respond to two summonses for jury duty. The deputy warned that she needed to appear at the government center immediately and post a $495 bond or deputies would be dispatched to arrest her at home. He even provided a warrant number to reference when posting bail. It was a complete scam. There was no jury duty summons, no bench warrant, and the person calling was not a sheriff's deputy. Scam artists are known to call unsuspecting residents and threaten them with arrest. They usually offer to satisfy the fine by taking credit card payments over the phone. Government agencies never make first contact by telephone. Whether it's someone claiming to be from the IRS, the FBI, the local police, or court, all communication is initiated by letter. No government official will call to warn of a bench warrant or unpaid fine. Every county has a warrant hotline that members of the public can call to confirm arrest warrants or report the location of someone who has an outstanding warrant. In Hennepin County, the number is 612-348-2000. Thanks for watching First Responder TV, your local public safety source. If you have an idea for a segment or an upcoming public safety or fire prevention event, please let us know. This is Kelly Murphy Rangate giving you information you can use to share and to live by. Stay safe and see you next time.